Researchers used abortionist surveys and say 63% of all abortions were progesterone-blocking chemical abortions. The world of legacy media wants to deny, dismiss, or simply delete the work of the Center for Medical Progress. Its allegations of abortion specimens sold in violation of federal law are again coming to light in new hearings by Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. Her black market of baby harvesting hearings condemned the abortion specimen trade that connects abortion industry to prominent universities. This is Life News Radio. A culture of life is like a bright city on a hill. Just as people in 1890 might have had difficulty imagining today's cities, so it may be today in imagining a culture of life. But it starts with more than imagination. It starts with the moral commitment to offer the highest regard to the gift of God hidden within each human life. Let's become the culture of life. Republican consultants are struggling how to tell Americans that Democrats embrace no limits on abortion. Kellyanne Conway blasts harsh, sentimental rhetoric as something easily countered by abortion-friendly candidates. But people like Florida Senator Marco Rubio say it's a simple matter to connect extreme Democrat legislation with the facts of abortion without limits. And layers of new polls show trouble for incumbent President Biden. In one, Catholic voters in Michigan favor Donald Trump by 23 points. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. There's a lot of depth and interesting details in the story of the woman at the well. Jesus asks a Samaritan woman for a drink while his disciples are off to buy food. And this request leads to a fascinating conversation. Jesus reveals to her that he has living water that will cause those who drink it to never thirst again. He also reveals that he knows the details of her personal relationships with several husbands and even tells her, a non-Jew, that he is the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. We are told that the woman leaves her water jar at the well and goes off to tell the people in town about him. It's as if she completely abandons her important mission for water. She abandons bodily comforts for more important things. And this echoes the apostles who left behind their fishing nets to go follow Jesus. What are we willing to abandon and leave behind to follow the Lord this Lent? This is Matt Maloney from knowthefaith.net. When you talk to people who were locked in sin and you can't convince them to leave their sin, it's because they don't have any fear of hell. They fear God, they don't want to offend him, but nobody talks about the fact that hell's real or that it endures forever. So you stand before the truth of God and you're illuminated completely in his truth. All you see is all the filthiness, the wretchedness, how vile you are and how you hate him. You hate the one that you stand in front of. So what if he tries to give you a hug? You hate him, you won't accept it. What if he says, please come in? I hate you, I would never come in there. This is how horrible it is. This is, this is what has to be meditated on. To die in a state of sin means that you hate God. Whether you feel like you hate God or you don't, it doesn't matter. Not having the grace of God means you hate him. That's Sermons for Everyday Living from six to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. The Catholic Current, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. St. Jerome said ignorance of scriptures is ignorance of Christ. And again, that's not news to you. I'm sure you've known that for decades. But how did the writing of this book confirm what St. Jerome said? Yeah, I'm glad we have a couple hours to talk about Well, well, sure. Yeah, use both sides of the paper if necessary, yeah. The Catholic Current, 5 p.m. Eastern, from the Station of the Cross and on the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Joe McLean, and you're listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of the truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. Go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What do you need to know right now?
bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, Mass of the Ages, it is out. It's out. You could watch this. I watched it last night with my family, and I want to share with you my take on the third installment of the trilogy of the Mass of the Ages and um, I thought there was some beautiful things to be said there for sure. Guardians of tradition. But I think there's some some prizes there. So maybe some spoilers, some minor spoilers ahead at 14 past the hour. And if you watched the film, I'd love to get your take on it. Of course, we'll have an after show and you can always comment and chime in and let us know what you think. All of that coming up in this hour. Also in this hour, let's have a conversation about the Reconquista or the need for the Reconquista because golly you is, it, who knew Spain of all places is um, not a very Christian place these days. Kind of like Ireland a little bit. We're going to get Father Charles Murr on the program to talk about Spain. We might also get his take on the uh, the third installment of Mass of the Ages. So Father Charles Murr's on deck at 30 past the hour. We'll put links to everything in the show notes today over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Also, I released the fourth installment of of the uh, Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence um, series for Lent yesterday. So, and yesterday was a big one, hour and a half. You can find that on the mobile app. If you download the iCatholic Radio mobile app today, you'll find it in your iOS or Android app store. Just search for iCatholic Radio in the ICR Premium tab on the bottom right. You'll be able to access the entire series, plus the expose on the Catholic Relief Services we released, the documentary film, talks, and more in the ICR Plus tab of the mobile app. Just go and download iCatholic Radio and be on the team today. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Saint Nicholas Owen, pray for us. Nicholas, also known as Little John for his short stature, was born to a devout Catholic family in Oxford around the year 1562, in the midst of the Catholic persecutions known as the Penal Laws under Queen Elizabeth I, or Bloody Bess. Inspired by his carpenter father, Nicholas became a joiner, a woodworker who specializes in joints. Nicholas's two older brothers became priests, and his younger brother, the only one of the four to marry, secretly printed Catholic writings. Nicholas joined the Society of Jesus as a lay brother, and became a servant of St. Edmund Campion. At that saint's execution, Nicholas loudly protested Campion's innocence and was briefly imprisoned as a result. Nicholas then served other Jesuit priests for almost two decades, including English Jesuit superior Father Henry Garnet. During this time, Nicholas was also the preeminent builder of priest holes throughout England, using his woodworking skills to create ingenious hiding places for priests in the homes of English Catholics. Nicholas was arrested again, and this time tortured, but revealed nothing. And since he was considered an unimportant servant, he was released when a wealthy Catholic family paid his fine. Nicholas then planned Jesuit father John Gerard's daring escape from the Tower of London, which included the brave priest crossing the tower moat on a rope, despite his hands having been badly mangled during torture. In the year of our Lord, 1606, Nicholas was arrested again, giving himself up willingly in an attempt to allow Father Garnet to escape. Horribly tortured for days in the Tower prison, Nicholas refused to reveal any names or secrets and died of his injuries. He and the other 40 martyrs of England and Wales are celebrated together on October 25th or May 4th. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saints and seasons. Saint Nicholas Owen, pray for us. The Hunted Priest. You should pick up that book. It is so, so very good. And now your headline news. The Daily Wire reports internal docs show entire intelligence community 
warned to avoid pro problematic phrases on Islamic terrorism. An internal newsletter sent by diversity, equity, and inclusion officials in the Biden administration's top intelligence agency warns personnel not to use problematic phrases, phrases that might include Salafi jihadist, jihadist, Islamic extremist, Sunni Shia extremism, radical Islamists, and others. The article is part of the newsletter created by ODNI's Intelligence Community, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Office and sent out to personnel throughout the intelligence community, which includes the country's most powerful executive agencies like the CIA, NSA, FBI, DHS, and DOJ, as well as military intelligence assets. The Pillar reports Belgian bishop laicized 14 years after admitting abuse. Pope Francis has laicized Bishop Roger Van Gelu almost 14 years after the Belgian prelate resigned after admitting that he had abused a nephew. The Apostolic Nunciature in Belgium said that in a statement, serious new elements had emerged in recent months, prompting the Vatican's dicastery for the doctrine of the faith to reopen the case against former Bishop of Bruges, who stepped down in 2010. The dicastery, which handles abuse cases, presented a file to Pope Francis March the 8th, recommending the bishop's dismissal from the clerical state. Boy, it took a long time, didn't it? The New York Post is reporting over 100 migrants break through razor wire, knock down guards as they illegally cross El Paso border in wild scene. The Texas National Guard were attempting to organize them into smaller groups, but the situation grew tense after some women and children were separated from adult males by the guardsmen. Video taken by the post showed one set of migrants, mostly single men, then rushing the Texas troops. In the video, some figures put their hands up and surrender, but then seconds later, they scramble through with some coming through their legs, knocking them out of the way. The group then scrambled to the border gate and started to shout at guardsmen on the other side. Yikes, those, those are your headline news. Hey, the gospel today comes to us from John 10, Verses 31 through 42. The Jews picked up rocks to stone Jesus. And Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from my Father. From which of these are you trying to stone me? The Jews answered him, We are not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. You, a man, are making yourself God. And Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If it calls them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, can you say that the one whom the Father has consecrated and sent into the world blasphemes because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not perform my Father's works, do not believe me. But if I perform them, even if you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may realize and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Then they tried again to arrest him, but he escaped from their power. He went back across the Jordan to the place where John first baptized, and there he remained. Many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but everything John said about this man was true. And many there began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Cornelius Alapide, in his exquisite commentary on sacred scripture, says the Jews show in this their, hypo their hypocrisy and their hatred for Christ, and that they did not honestly but craftily and insidiously Ask him whether he were the Christ. So there's always a hidden agenda, but the Lord always brings the, the trap, doesn't he? He doesn't. He knows their hearts. He knows their intent. He knows what they're going to do or say before they do it. And he still does not force their hand. He still gives them an opportunity uh, to uh, maybe repent before it is too late. Mystically, says St. Hilary, uh, going on from the commentary of St. Uh, or I, I, Freudian slip, I... I already canonized Cornelius Lapide. Maybe someday. Anyway, he says, And now also heretics hurl the stones of their words to cast down, if they can, Christ from his throne, inspired no doubt by Lucifer, who aimed at obtaining this throne of the Godhead, and therefore grudged 
it to Christ and is active in taking it away by means of heretics. You know, I, th- I find it utterly fascinating. Again, I like to point to John 8. Now we're in John 10. And clearly the Lord is doubling, tripling, and quadrupling down on the proposition that he is God. <laughs> Let there be no mistake. Let there be no ambiguity, no vagueness. He is repeating the phrase over and over, I am, ego a me. I and the Father are one. I am the Son of God. Like this. <laughs> This, the Jews recognize this, but so many today fail to recognize what the Jews recognized back in the first century, that Jesus makes the claim he is God. And if he is in fact God, if it is true, if what he says is true, the implications are massive. Jimmy Kimmel, who is blaspheming and making fun of Jesus Christ, who purports to be a Catholic, for instance, he is just one representative of thousands and thousands of uh, supposed Catholics or Christians who say one thing with their mouth and do quite the opposite with their heart, with their actions, with their lives, with their bodies. If Jesus is God, if what he says is true, if what he claims is true and that he is God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you and you are about to be judged. Repent, believe in the gospel while you still have yet time, while you have breath in your lungs. What an opportunity you have today. Speaking of opportunities coming up after the break, I want to share with you my thoughts on the third installment of Mass of the Ages. It's coming up next. Here at the Station of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices, and we're grateful for the feedback we've received. I discovered the Station of the Cross rather providentially a year ago. I've been a loyal listener ever since. I can't overestimate the value of the station when it's made a difference in my life in terms of making me better informed Catholic. It has enriched my faith and sold me during tough times. It made me laugh on several occasions. I commend the important work of this great apostolate. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I listen to the radio. And if I can listen to something that brings me closer to God, closer to Jesus Christ, then it's the most beautiful thing. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network is dedicated to answering the critical need of access to quality, consistent, professional, and proven Catholic programming. We cannot rely on other media outlets to properly represent our church. Catholic Radio reaches Catholics, non-Catholic Christians, and non-believers alike. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent of your diocese, our apostolate is listener-supported. We hear all the time from listeners who discovered the station by seeing a Tri-God bumper magnet in traffic. You can request a free bumper magnet and start evangelizing just by driving around town. Go to thestationofthecross.com and click on Promotional Material under the About tab. There you can request a magnet for your listening area. We even have one for the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Request yours today. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with Father Charles Murr. There was a story. I caught this from Anthony Stein over at Return to Tradition. Uh, I love his channel, by the way. Uh, He talked about this story of this priest, this um, Benedictine out of Spain, who talks about the faith in Spain being like basically decimated. And I, I, I've had to pull on that thread. So I started to read some of these articles in this interview with this priest. And I asked Father Charles Murr to be on to talk about this. We might even get into uh, to uh, the Mass of the Ages with Father Murr as well today. So stick around for that. That's coming up at 30 past the hour. Share us with a friend. We'd be grateful. But the third installment of the Mass of the Ages trilogy has been released. It was available this week on their YouTube channel free. You don't got to do anything. Just got to hit play. And you can watch it. I sat down and watched it with my family last night for the first time. And now we've seen all three installments. And there are some surprises here. 
Um, you know, today, this morning, I asked, I asked uh, Trad Jack Burton, our, our producer, Jake. I asked Jake, hey, Jake, have you seen the film? Jake, what'd you say? I said, no, I haven't. Why do you hate it, Jake? Hmm? Hmm? Why do you loathe the Mass of the Ages, sir? Why? Can you explain to me? Why wouldn't you watch this? Did you eat, Jake? Did you sleep, Jake? I bet you tied your shoes, Jake, but you didn't watch The Mass of the Ages. Why is that? Do you That's know? That's correct. I've failed in my duty as a trad to watch Mass, Mass of the Ages immediately <sighs> when it comes out and not just, you know, wait until the weekend or when it's convenient. I may have to I go have back failed. into my safe space. I'm just not feeling very comfortable right now. But here's surprise number one about the film. The movie is not made for trads. The movie's really not made for traditional Catholics. It's made for those... Catholics who are not traditional and don't really understand what the traditional movement really is or what it's about or who, why do people care that much about the traditional Latin mass? This movie's really made for them. Uh, and I think that's, um, th I think that's good, actually. I think it's very good to try to explain what so many traditional Catholics really haven't done a great job in explaining. Some have done fantastic, but I think many Catholics who are in the traditional movement uh, failed to, and I put myself in this category, failed to really communicate what it is about the tradition of Holy Mother Church, the traditional forms of piety, of liturgy, that is so attractive, especially, especially to the young people. The other thing the film does, which is also very interesting and surprising, is really deals with Traditionis Custodis. Uh, what exactly led to the issuing of Traditionis Custodis? What was the norm? What was the rule before Traditionis Custodis came out? And it really tried to deal with the history in a, it's a very truncated way, to be sure, but to deal with the history in a way that's it's accessible. And I got to say this, no matter how you feel about the traditional movement, about uh, the Mass of the Ages trilogy or anything else in between, I think you can't argue very much with the, with the reality that they make a beautiful product. They are very good cinematographers. It is very well shot. It is very well edited. I mean, there was some, I think there can be some critique here, but uh, the, the camera angles and everything are very, very beautiful, to say the least. So I really appreciated that. There are some other surprises in the third release of the Guardians of Tradition, the Mass of the Ages. And I want to play, I'm going to play, I'm not going to play the audio, but I am playing a clip right now in the background. Just if I'm only showing the video, I'm not playing the audio. I'm not sure how the copyright thing will work here on the, on our streaming platforms. But nonetheless, what I am playing, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to describe this to you. And this was, this is how the film starts off. And it, you almost start crying right when you see it. You see a beautiful church, what looks like a beautiful old church somewhere in France. And you're hearing the narration of a lovely young woman who's speaking in French to us, only to describe what has now become a hotel. What used to be a beautiful church where the traditional mass was once said on the high altar, the consecration, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who condescended from his throne in heaven to be present among us, as he promised us in Matthew's gospel in chapter 28, that he would be with us until the end. And he is eucharistically present with us every single day on the altars of thousands and thousands of churches and chapels and missions all across the planet. And in some of those places, they were epically beautiful they were ordained exquisitely with the stained glass windows, the vaulted ceilings, the iconography, the, the intricate and beautifully detailed high altars, the exquisite intention to bring about the consecration in the most reverent, sacred, and holy way. The mass of the faithful coming up to the altar, kneeling in, in humility before the Lord, saying, Lord, I cannot receive you unless you give me the grace to do so. This intent at the heart of so many thousands of faithful over the centuries to extend their tongue in humiliation to receive the gift of God, so sublime, so divine on their tongue, and to see these churches now transformed into hotels, skate parks, nightclubs, pubs, burnt to the ground it's heart-wrenching it's heart-wrenching and the film starts there the film starts there but it doesn't stop there so truly there is a tragedy 
of something beautiful that has been lost. That's a message that I think applies and all Catholics, all Catholics of goodwill, all Catholics of sincerity, no matter whether you go to the Novus Ordo, whether you're an Eastern Catholic, you go to the Byzantine or, or the Maronite or, or the Chaldean, the Syro-Malabarian, uh, or you're like me, you're a Roman Catholic, and just again, you go to the Novus Ordo, you should care. Why should you care? Because something beautiful is clearly under attack. Something exquisite something sublime, something intentional has been attacked and lost. And that should matter to all Catholics of goodwill, not just because you go to the church line mass or not. You should care about this. And I think the film does a good job of setting that argument up, maybe not in an over-the-top kind of a way, but one way in a way that we should actually pay attention to. And the film does a very good job of that. There are other big surprises in the film. For instance, I was really caught off guard by the appearance of Trent Horn, the Catholic Answers apologist. The Council of Trent being his um, podcast. Uh, Scott Hahn, Dr. Scott Hahn was in the film. I was surprised to see Scott Hahn. Patrick Madrid, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see Patrick Madrid coming, for sure. I was very caught off guard by that, to see Patrick Madrid on the film. Um, how about uh, Leah Darrow? Uh, now, Leah Soldanini It was in the film with her husband and her family. Now, you might remember Leah Darrow. She, she was big on the scene back in like the Sikh conferences and the Steubenville conferences back in the day. You know, probably 10 years ago or so, she was a, a formal, former model in New York City. And she underwent a reversion to the faith. Had a very touching story of how her father came to rescue her from the clutches of, of insanity in the modeling industry. I interviewed her myself probably 2010, 2011, someplace in there. I interviewed Leah Darrow. Now, Leah and her husband and her family are traditional Catholics. And they share uh, the experience of becoming traditional Catholics and how it was not an easy, it wasn't a very smooth journey. It was pretty rocky. I can relate to that myself. And, um, you know, Father Fessio of Ignatius Press is in the film. Again, very, very surprising. So I was, I had to, I was pleasantly surprised with, with a lot that I saw in the film. And then I was caught off guard by some of the other elements that I saw in the film. Now, here's the thing, though. You got, like I said, you got to hand it to Mass of the Ages for their, for their cinematography and their storytelling. Very good. Their animations, I got to tell you, their animations are, are superior in almost every way. I don't know why my camera is so far off. But uh, their, their animations are top-notch all the way. And this was what I loved most about the second installment of Mass of the Ages. The second installment, the first installment of the film was really geared towards an introduction. What is this traditional movement? Who are these traditionalists? The second installment was much more intense, much more detailed, and it was about how did the Nova Sordo come about? I think some of the mistaking uh, belief is that Vatican II did this, don't you know? Well, actually, Vatican II didn't. Vatican II called to preserve Gregorian chant called to preserve Latin as a, as a liturgical language. The, it wasn't Vatican II that gave us what we now uh, today call and, and, and think of as the Novus Ordo. That would happen under Archbishop Bugnini, Bugnini in the 1960s, in the late 1960s. It was after Vatican II that Bugnini came up with what we now call uh, the Novus Ordo. And they do a beautiful job in the second episode of Mass of the Ages in discussing how that happened and what were the changes. And they do so in a graphic way that's easy to understand and see the significance and the gravity of very, very quickly at a high level. So you got to hand it to them. No matter how you feel about Mass of the Ages, they did a beautiful job in production, which today... It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, there's a lot of technology that allows, there's a lot of skill sets that are now more available to more, you know, sort of like outside of Hollywood circles, for instance, that make it possible to make interesting and more beautiful uh, productions. But to create those animations, that's still a very expensive, incredibly time-consuming process. 
and they have clearly put the effort in. And I and my hat's off to them for that alone because so much goes into just being able to demonstrate graphically these concepts so that everyone can see it very quick, and they, they accomplish that. But the real tearjerker, I think, in the third episode, which, again, is not geared towards trads, the real tearjerker for me was to see the group of moms. These are grandmas, moms. They had sons. All of these moms had sons who had priests, who were priests. And these moms in France decided that they wanted their voice to be heard in response to Traditionis Custodis, and they wanted to say, they wanted to offer that voice directly to the Pope himself. So these moms got together and they collected, I can't remember how many letters, thousands of letters of concerned Catholics, thousands of letters of concerned Catholics who wanted to express to the Holy Father their desire that he protect and uphold the, the tradition of the church and defend the church in Latin Mass and provide it for the faithful rather than take it away. So these moms got together and they collected all these letters and then they walked from northern France all the way down to Rome. They walked. These are grandmas. These are moms. And they walked and they carried all these letters with them on their back. It took them two months to get that done. And then in St. Peter's Square, they met with the Pope. They did. They were there. They handed him, they handed him the letters. It's a tearjerker. I won't spoil everything about the film. I've already given enough away, I'm sure. But it is a tearjerker to see that they love the Mass so much. They, and in honor of their sons who are priests, wanted to express that desire to the Holy Father himself. And even if you don't go to the, to the traditional Latin Mass, I hope that the trilogy of the Mass of the Ages films at least gives you an understanding why so, so many that do go, like myself, why do we go? Why do we love it? Why have we grown in love with it? Like Leah Darrow and her husband and her family. I can relate. I didn't have a smooth journey into the traditional community or the traditional Latin Mass. It's kind of rocky, kind of bumpy. But nonetheless, once you have a sense of that sacred and that beauty, boy, does it ever capture your heart. And you just want more and not less. Speaking of which, Father Charles Murr is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Father Jim Netto of the Diocese of Portland, Maine. In Krakow, Poland on the 2nd of June, 1938, the Lord Jesus himself directed a young Polish Sister of Mercy on a three-day retreat. Sister Faustina painstakingly recorded Christ's instructions in her diary, that is, a mystical manual on prayer and divine mercy. These instructions became Faustina's weapon in fighting the good fight. Jesus began, my daughter, I want to teach you about spiritual warfare. Secret number 24. Know that you are on a great stage where all heaven and earth are watching you. This secret reminds us that we are all on a great stage where heaven and earth are watching. What message is our life giving? What radiates from us? Shades of light, darkness, or gray? The way we live attracts more light or more darkness. If the devil does not succeed in pulling us into darkness, he tries to keep us in the category of the lukewarm, which is not pleasing to God. For a lukewarm soul is not yet quite dead in the eyes of God, because the faith and the hope and the charity that are its spiritual life are not altogether extinct. But it's a faith without zeal. It is a hope without resolution. It is a charity without passion. The lukewarm soul is like a turtle. It moves only by dragging itself along the ground. You can see it getting from place to place with great difficulty. Lord God, your word tells us that if a soul remains lukewarm for a lifetime, you will spit it out of your mouth. Save us from that fate. Breathe the spark within us to make it a blazing fire of love for you. a Catholic ticket, bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. Here are your headline news. 
Breitbart reports DOJ hits Apple with antitrust law alleging abuse of monopoly power. The suit filed by the DOJ and 16 attorneys general in the federal court in the District of New Jersey alleges that Apple has violated antitrust laws by blocking rivals from accessing hardware and software features of its iPhones, among other abuses of monopoly power. This latest legal action marks the third time in the past 14 years that the DOJ has sued Apple for antitrust violations, but it is the first case accusing the iPhone maker of illegally maintaining its dominant market position. Ground News reports U.S. doctors perform world's first genetically edited pig kidney transplant. Surgeons have successfully transplanted a kidney from a genetically modified pig into a person for the first time with the Massachusetts General Hospital announcing the procedure. The recipient, Richard Slayman, 62 years old, who is recovering well, expressed hope for others in need of transplants. The four-hour surgery took place in Boston, Massachusetts, and Slayman is expected to be discharged soon. In Catholic Vote Reports, minibus spending bill filled with far-left funding. The minibus spending bill currently under consideration in Congress would allocate hundreds of millions in federal taxpayer dollars toward wasteful spending, diversity, training, and other countries' border security, according to Advancing American Freedom. It also includes funding for transgenderism, late-term abortions, and anti-Israel advocacy. The bill would allocate $200 million taxpayer dollars to gender equality and equality action alone. And those, those are your headline news. Praise be to God. Hey, Karen, God love you. Thank you for that. You're so very uh, generous. Praise be to Jesus. Hey, did I mention, I don't know if I mentioned this story, but this is a piece of good news. We're waiting for Father Murr to connect to us. He should be here any second. Uh, the Capitol Police late Tuesday dropped their charges against Steve Nikoi. Uh, did you, I don't know if you remember the, 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 the speech that Biden gave, the State of the Union address, what was that, two weeks ago now, a week and a half ago? I forget. But there was a gentleman up in the, uh, on the balcony there who stood up and started yelling and nobody could quite understand what he was saying or what he was yelling about. Turns out this was Steve Nikoi. He's a gold star father who emotionally interrupted the president and the state of the union two weeks ago now because um, Biden claimed America is safer under him than under Trump. But Steve lost his son at the gate there at the airport in Afghanistan when the Biden administration withdrew from Af Afghanistan in a hasty way. So he lost his son. So he was there to represent his son and all those who died in that insane evacuation. Well, the good news is they dropped the charges against him. They were going to charge him for that outburst there, and they dropped the charges against him. So praise be to God for that. I also want to point out My Catholic Will. MyCatholicWill.com is a sponsor of the Station of the Cross, and we couldn't be more grateful. And I'm told that if you go to MyCatholicWill.com forward slash the Station of the Cross and use referral code 14 stations that you can receive a free will. Do you have a will? Are you prepared to um, to leave your last will and testament for those that are going to have to sort out your situation? Well, you might have an opportunity here to get a free one with the referral code 14 stations. If you go to mycatholicwill.com forward slash the Station of the Cross, but could you consider, would you consider, might you consider possibly leaving the Station of the Cross in your will. It'd be a fantastic way to support our work and what we do today. So check it out. TheStationOfTheCross.com forward slash uh, ACT is, is our, um, I wanted to change my camera. That's what I want to do, is our uh, website, TheStationOfTheCross.com forward slash ACT. Look for the show notes there. All right. We're waiting for Father Charles Murr to join us on the team today. We wanted to talk about this story out of Spain, the Reconquista. It seems like we need another one. It might be that we need another one. I was watching Dr. Anthony Stein on Return to Tradition. Santiago Cantera. In Spain, there is hatred of the cross is the headline that Dr. Stein covered. And I, it's linking to an interview over at uh, another website, revisitmission.com. We're going to put a link to both of them in the show notes for you today. I want to read a bit to you, and hopefully when we get Father Murr on, we'll be able to get him to comment today. But Santiago Cantera, prior of the Valley of the Fallen, since I was a child, I've desired to be, desired to, uh, for the grace of martyrdom. So here's a little bit. 
this guy is a Benedictine, and he is at a famous shrine. In fact, he's one of the biggest ones in the world, even. So he's the prior. But it's what he says that's very interesting. And I'm going to skip down here. It says, in these years, it has received many attacks. How have you handled it, is the question. Fundamentally, embracing the cross, and he's talking about the cross. There's a ginormous cross where, where at, the, at this shrine where he's at, this, this basilica where he's at. It's a massive cross, and it can be seen for miles. It says, fundamentally embracing the cross. We live next to the largest cross in the world. The Christian discovers the meaning of life on the cross. And embracing it in these difficult moments gives a transcendent meaning and knows that together with the redemptive mystery of Christ, this pain offered has a positive value for the salvation of humanity and to repair the lack of love towards God. That's my experience. It goes on. This is how it looks. In Spain, there is hatred of the cross. There have been statements from the media and politicians that have explicitly called for the demolition of this cross. It is noted that the cross is a sign of contradiction. Jesus Christ himself is a sign of contradiction among men because he brings a message of truth and love and many reject it. What breaks my heart is this is in the place of of St. Ferdinand, of Isabel. There are so many uh, of Ignatius of Loyola. This is Spain that we're talking about, and they're trying to tear down the cross. Joining us now, Father Charles Murr. Good morning to you, Father. Thanks for your time today. A hearty good morning to you, Joe. How you doing? Praise be to God. I am alive and that counts. And uh, glory be to God for it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're alive today. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, yes, you live... I, I am too. That makes two you, of live, yes. you live deep in the heart of Spain, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I'm, trying to wrap my, I'm trying to wrap my head around Spain. <laughs> I, I, I am a huge fan of Warren Carroll and his book, uh, his series on Christendom. And uh, he has been accused by some, Warren Carroll has been accused by some, that he was madly in love with Isabel because he writes so romantic of her and he put, he puts her on a pedestal. And I'm going to say I agree with him. I think she was fantastic. I think she was heroic excuse and courageous. Me, excuse me, Joe, is, is there something wrong with that? No, that's my point. But here's the <laughs> kicker. Here's the punchline, Father. What in the world is going on in Spain? How could the land of Isabel, how could the land of Ferdinand, how could the land of, of Don Juan, how could the land of, of St. Ignatius of Loyola, let alone all the other amazing saints, how could that be the land where they're trying to tear down the cross? Uh, Spain is, in, is part of a great part of Western civilization. And the war is on Western civilization. You know that. You know that. It's the same war that's going on in the United States, in Canada, all over the world. <coughs> and it is Western civilization committing suicide. It's Western civilization against Western civilization. This is it. Wow. There's a particular hatred in Spain. After, after uh, uh, General Franco died and reestablished the monarchy, uh, all of the people who were opposed to him, who left the country, returned. Mm. They all came back. <laughs> and then, uh, it's not been fun since. I'm, I, this, is what, this is what the locals are telling me. I'm trying to mm. pick up, because it doesn't make any sense to me either. This hatred for, uh, for Christ, hatred for the church, especially of the clergy, it's incredible. Now, don't get it, don't get me wrong. I would I would say that half at least half of Spain is is uh, is Catholic and mm. and and uh, and mostly practicing Catholics, they're believers. But how loud is the left? How loud is the left? They have all of the media behind them. They have they're, they're well organized. I'll tell you the devil has really put together a, one heck of an organizational program. <laughs> wow, he's he's good at that, isn't he? He's very good at that. So, all he right, doesn't sleep away. There's a there's a there's a, a Spanish saying. It says that when the devil isn't fishing, he's mending his nets. Mm. What was the impact of the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s? How how much how much has that scarred that nation? <sighs> terrible, terrible, and the scars are still are still with us. I'm learning this as I go along. I, I like talking to people. 
I go to any place in a restaurant, a, a, a coffee bar, whatever, within a, a minute, I'm in a conversation with somebody. I can and imagine. One great thing that the Spaniards have, that the Spaniards have, that I don't think, maybe the Mexicans also, but the Spaniards have it particularly uh, uh, gracefully. You can start a conversation with anyone in Andalusia anyway, immediately. Immediately, you're on the street standing waiting for a bus and you start a conversation and people engage immediately. Nobody looks at, it's not like New York City, where if I would right. say hello to somebody, they'd call the police, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they're very easy to converse with, very, very, and everyone has an opinion and everyone is eager to have an audience with whom to share that opinion, right? <laughs> so I, I, I ask these questions, I ask these questions and they freely answer them. Mm. What has come down to what I've noticed is this. That Span the Spanish Civil War was really a war uh, of good and evil. Mm. It, it, it just really was. It was like the Mexican Civil War, the Cristiada, uh, right before it. It was a war against good and evil. It's, it, you can name it any other way, by any other names, any other terms you wish, but that's what it was. Yeah. And the problem was this. Here's the problem. And, and I've noticed this, and I've done it on purpose to note it. When I run into people who are anti, let's just do it this way, anti-Franco, because that's the scar. That's the scar that still remains. The cross that they're trying to take down is the cross that was erected by uh, Francisco Franco, right? Mm -hmm. So, so half of it has to do with, with hatred for him. <laughs> half of Spain hates him, half of Spain loves him. And the okay. part that loves him is afraid to say so. All right, now, Can I want to ask... Just a minute, Joe. Here's... Okay, go ahead. Yes. I was just about to get to my major point, and this is it. I asked them, did anyone in your family die during the Civil War? And, of oh, wow. course, everyone has a family member. Now... Yeah. Who killed him? If it were the Franco forces that killed him, or if it was the Republican forces that killed him, that's the side they're on today. Got it. It, it has sense. nothing to do with it, truly with, with an ideology. It's still that uh, my grandfather was killed by, by the Republican forces. My grandfather was killed by the, by the Franco forces. That's mm. it. And those, those scars still live on today. You know, I find Franco kind of a complicated character. Um, so I'm hoping you can help me better understand him because I'm definitely on the outside looking in. You're a little more inside than I am, so I'm hoping you can help me with this. So Franco is a complicated character. Is he a practicing faithful Catholic? D why did he send a battalion of Spaniards yes, to is. fight for the yes, Nazis yes, against he, yes, the Russians? Did did Franco did First Franco have all, anything to do? I mean, did Franco have anything to do with allowing Nazis to escape through Spain? Uh, you know, in the rat, rat lines in into Southern America. So, like, uh, what was where, where 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 is Franco on the dial here? Help us understand. Franco is on the side of anything that works at the moment. Mm. He is uh, a, a man whose allegiance is ruled by expedience. <laughs> he, wow. He's trying to be pragmatic, pragmatic, practical. What works at the moment. He stayed out of World War II, got, got assistance from, from uh, Germany and from, from Italy. There's no question of that. But at the same mm. time, did not join their forces. Mm. And then at the end, end, ended up with the United States and, and, and Britain being on the same side. So he, he's back and forth on everything. He did what, whatever works. Fascinating. We're talking with Father Charles Murr. Talking about Spain, it, it kind of like Ireland, it just kind of breaks your heart to see these traditionally Catholic countries seemingly falling away from the faith. But it sounds to me like Father Murris just blew my mind a little bit because maybe maybe Spain is not as bad off as Ireland is. is. Maybe it's just maybe it's just the optics. Maybe it's the headlines. Maybe it's social media uh, that's sort of painting a picture. Maybe the squeaky wheel gets the gets the grease, and the squeakiest wheel of all is the far left and the anti-Catholics. Well, more on that with Father Charles Murr and the Reconquista coming up after the break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. The month of February is dedicated to the Holy Family. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless our family. 
open our hearts to receive your love. May our home be another Nazareth, so that our family may be a place where your peace and love abides. Open our eyes to recognize the gift and beauty of life, so that we may find joy in your presence among us. Grant us pure hearts seeking holiness, generous hearts full of your love, merciful hearts ready to forgive, and tender hearts full of kindness. May our family be a sanctuary of life and love, a beacon of hope, drawing others to your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Holy Family of Nazareth, pray for us. I'm Jim Havens, host of The Simple Truth, heard weekdays at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. This is kind of the playbook of how the culture has been so decimated and destroyed. I think the most important thing is to just recognize how much we have been manipulated. And, you know, I've come to see <laughs> anytime Christianity and Judaism are weak, the occult just fills in. It's like the jungle. You know, the weeds just come in and that's what fills the gaps. That's The Simple Truth, weekdays at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. What you're offering and giving to me, you deserve to get back because you're offering more than I can give. I learned so much through the station on the cross. I listen to the radio station daily and I absolutely love it. I was attending the chapel and places like that and through your programs I was able to find out how other Protestants had come back into the Catholic Church. God bless the station of the cross. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. Praise be to God. It is Friday. Oh, cannot wait. I cannot wait to get to the weekend so I can do the honeydew list for my wife. I'm, I'm teasing, actually. I'm not looking forward to that. Father Charles Murr is our guest. We're having a conversation about, about Spain. Where is Spain at? And we're going to go into the after show at the top of the hour, and hopefully Father can continue on with us. Maybe we'll get his opinion on uh, on uh, on the Mass of the Ages, third installment, and Bugnini. I want to talk about Bugnini again with you. But Father, I want to, uh, so Spain, I, I'm, again, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Where would you, compared to Ireland, where is Spain? I mean, let's see. What's the most Catholic country on the planet still today? Uh, it's hard to say. What would you say, Father, is the most Catholic Poland. country? Poland? Poland? Okay, so Poland. Poland. So between Poland uh, and Ireland, uh, where is Spain? I don't know. It's, it's more complex than that. It really is. <clears throat> the, it, it, the thing is that Ireland doesn't, though the Irish hold on to grudges longer than anybody else, I know I'm Irish and from, a, from an Irish family. Uh, they, remember, they, they used to joke that Irish Alzheimer's definition yeah. of that was you forget everything but the grudge? Everything but the grudge, yeah. Mm. yeah that, that seems to make it. sense to me. But yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> you forget everything but the grudge. The, the, the Irish, the Irish for the longest time, and I know this from my great-grandmother from County Mayo, uh, would, they would talk about the English as if as if they were uh, assaulted that morning. <laughs> it's right. You know, yes. they, uh, rather than you know, it, it was amazing. I, I, uh, I thought this was uh, something going on. Then I started reading the history. It was like 300, 400 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> right. But the yeah. Spaniards have have a more recent history. Have a more mm. recent history of violence, and it affected every family. And, and it's strange because I, I, I took this as a hunch and I'm just trying to back it up with, in my private inquest, uh, did a family member of yours die on this side or that side? And what mm -hmm. is your political leaning? What are your political leanings today? They're the same thing. Who died? The last one to die was the, per the side that they were, that they condemned. The, they, mm -hmm. they condemned the side that killed, right? So, uh, so it's, it's complicated. And, and yeah. at the same time, and at the same time, it, it is amazing the Catholic traditions that are still very much in force here. Uh, uh, Holy Week is something like you've never seen. Uh, I, I, I've seen the video. It's, it's, I would no, no, love amazing. to be at some of those passion uh, processions. They look utterly you amazing. You can't get close. To them. You have to stand there for three days in advance to be able to see the, the, the procession pass by. It's amazing how well it's attended. 
Uh, that would be tempting to try that. Hey, by the way, Karen is on the team today. Karen's uh, one of our insiders, and Karen was just on a uh, on a, a pilgrimage with you, apparently. So Karen says to say hello. And, uh, oh, the so poor great. thing. Did she, she survived it? <laughs> she did. She <laughs> seems to have loved it. I mean, if, wow, who knew? Praise be to Jesus. So oh, I guess oh. I'm, I'm trying to understand because sometimes there's, there's I no feel... For days. There's no accounting for it. I, sometimes I feel like I'm being triggered simple, simply by the headlines. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. So there's always this negative Nancy going on in social media and the, and the news. And I wonder how true some things are. So that's why I kind of I like to ask around when it comes to stories of, of like, it, you know, um, Ireland, which we talked to recently, somebody recently about that. And then, of course, now Spain. So it sounds to me like there's still a lot of meat on the bone when it comes to the Catholic faith in Spain, even though there are still uh, some very real scars left over from the Spanish Civil War. I still don't quite understand Franco, I mean, do, am I supposed to love him? Am I supposed to hate him? Was he a means to an end? Was he a, 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 a flawed person that God used to do to do some some good things? I mean, how are we to understand him? I still don't quite understand that. Well, I think that if you want to put any human being, much less a leader of of, of a people, in a category of good or bad, uh, I think you're wrong. Uh, even with popes. It doesn't work that way. They're not just good or bad because we're all complex. And Franco was a very complicated man. What, what he tried to do, and I've talked to many, many people about this, people who, who actually follow politics uh, as a passion, uh, he did whatever was required for survival. Yeah. Whatever, okay. whatever. It's sort of like Juan Perón in Argentina. Something like that, but not 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 as Perón was just a yes man to everyone. At least Franco had had some principles, uh, but but he he it was it was he was in survival mode, and he wanted his country to survive. Well, you have to concede a lot of things. It's a back and forth, uh, and he was willing to do that to come out uh, to come out on top. Uh, he also did something that's that's unpopular at that time. He protected the Catholic Church. Mm. Now, when you're on the winning side and you protect the church, those on the left take the church as the enemy. It's, it's, it's a natural response. They can't, they can't insult Franco. He's dead. Well, actually, they could, they could insult him. They did the, probably the maximum insult that you could do. They dug him up and moved his grave. Wow. From the valley of the valley of the of the Caídos, from from that cross that you had, there's yeah. Franco was buried in that basilica. They they took him out and buried him elsewhere. This was just two years ago or so. That's, as as, that's a, as a, the socialist the socialist managed to do that. So this is this is this is the uh, this is the socialist. This is the left moving uh, against Franco and against and not just against they're against everything that is the church the faith, uh, stability, anything non-Marxist, mm. uh, they're against. Do you think they'll win? Will they now, win in Spain? There's, there's something else too, Joe. There's something else too. They, they, they actually, the left actually lost in the last, the last elections. They were gratis. They lost. And as, a, as, a, as an 11th hour thing, they grabbed other small parties and made a coalition to be able to survive, but they lost. Just like in Ireland... They, they they lost the elections the other day and the prime minister resigned right yeah over motherhood in Ireland over motherhood can you imagine Praise be to God, Praise <laughs> be to God. it's it's to that it's to that point so yeah. these people are against the, it's the left against Western civilization and anything mm -hmm. that is a reminder of Western civilization is the enemy that's the way they see it so how deep is the Catholic faith because I mean when I met my wife and she's Portuguese from from the Azores. I noticed that there were, they were Catholics. They still had a lot of Catholic celebrations they did, but the faith was a little more on the shallow side for a lot of uh, the Azorean uh, migrants into the United States. So is it, it, could it be, is it the same? Is it deeper in Spain? Do the, is there a lot of hope still? I don't know, and, but I'll, I'll tell you this. This is just, this, again, this is my general opinion. Uh, I'm no expert on the matter, but, but having lived here for these last few years, uh, and talking to people, you learn a lot. Well, what, did, what did Yogi Berra used to say? You can, you can, you can see a lot by watching. 
Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we'll have the, to. The I guess is this. Uh, yeah. I see. I see a lot. Of, I see a lot of the clergy. I know. I know uh, um, quite a number of clergy. I see a lot of the clergy being uh, uh, lukewarm. But that's I don't. Of- I don't see a lot of the clergy on fire with the message, or enthusiastic, or kind of. Uh, if it's people come sign. to mass, they come to mass. If they don't come to mass, they don't come to mass. It's it's that kind of a thing. That's not a good sign. <laughs> that's not a good sign for Isabel not, Spain. Not good at all, actually. Yeah, not good or for at Fernand all. Spain. We'll have to keep them in our prayers. We're coming up against the end of the hour here on the radio side. Father, I would like you to stay on. I want to get your take on on the Mass of the Ages. But before, I have to say goodbye here in just a few seconds. But uh, w- did you watch the film? I watched. I didn't watch the third film. I watched the, the pilgrimage of the, the mothers of the priests from yeah. Paris to Rome. Ooh. <laughs> which brought it brought it, it actually brought a tear to my eye. Yeah, I, really, I was talking I, about I that. Cried, I couldn't believe it. Now you were in the first <clears throat> one, so I want to get your I want to I want to talk to you about that invited here. Me to, they invited me to Dallas, Texas, to be part of the third showing. Oh, amazing! We'll see. All right, praise be to God. Hold that thought. We're going to go into the after show. If you want to be part of the after show, you got to be on the live video feed. You can do that in the mobile app, by the way. You got to just go and uh, to the ICR Plus tab, and you can scroll down to the live video player, or go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash act. That's the stationofthecross.com forward slash act. God love you. God bless you. So, what did you think of today's show? Let's discuss that right now in the after show. Your take on the after take. Comment. Interact live with me and the team. All you need to do is search for one of our live video feeds on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, LinkedIn, and elsewhere. Simply search for The Station of the Cross, Joe McLean, or A Catholic Take. I'm looking forward to seeing you and interacting with you directly. It all starts right now. It's the after show. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. And in the words of David Lynch, if you can believe it, it is Friday once again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very good <laughs> praise be to god oh by the way I, been, oh, I got so many rabbit holes i would like to go down with your father Murr. um what's his name you have a you have an affinity for um um it's friday my brain doesn't want to work <laughs> i gotta i gotta uh, father i gotta go to your website father charles Murr. Yeah, no, charles Murr.com. An affinity yeah, for WC Fields. Yes, I, I'm trying to like I I can see the picture in my my head, but I can't put the name on. W why? He's my, why, he's my why? favorite. He's my favorite comedian in the world. That explains a lot, Father. Why? Why is that? <laughs> Does it? <laughs> a dead giveaway, eh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he As is. A matter uh, of fact, Joe, I just got a letter from I just got a letter from someone from from Nigeria whose name was. Whose name is uh, Mishak? Okay. And this is the first Mishak that I've ever met. One of W. C. Fields' famous famous phrases, rather than swearing or an expletive, he used to always say, "Shadrach, Mishak, and Abednego," <laughs> <laughs> as an exclamation. And I congratulated. This is the first. I said, "You're the first Mishak that I've ever met." Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Didn't wasn't he an atheist? Uh, by the grace of God. <laughs> by by yes. the grace of God. He, actually, oh man! Actually, he he he, cla- he claimed he was, but he wasn't. Uh, really? He, he, they, one of one of his best friends walked into the hospital room shortly before he, he he died, and found him reading the Bible. Yeah. And and said to him, "WC, I thought you were an atheist." He said. I am. He said, well, what are you doing with the Bible? And Fields looked up and said, searching for loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Praise I can, be I can, to God. I can hear that in his voice, too. That's yeah. great. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> looking for the loopholes. The loopholes. Yeah. W.C. Yeah. Fields. Wow, and he, no was, he, he, was, he was also, he was married to a, a, in a Catholic marriage ceremony, baptized a Catholic, and was given okay. a Catholic funeral. W. C. Really? Wow. I did yep. not know all that. Praise be to God. Well, I'll pray for his soul then. 
Um, by the way, good morning Please to you. So. Eileen, good morning to you. T Storm, Trad Jack Burton, good morning to you. Luz, good morning to you. Damon, Carrie, Karen, Andy Bashaw, good morning to you. Nick the Mike and Sharon, good morning to you. Troy Lockett, glad you're here. Thanks for being on the team today. James 16897, good morning to you. Appreciate seeing you here. Lori and uh, Jane Steves, good morning to you. Glad you guys are here today. Thanks for doing it. Says maybe the Spaniards would be more appreciative that they are not Muslim. Uh, how is the Muslim po population migration situation in Spain? Is, is it as bad as like this in France? Me, I, we were just I was just talking to, I was just talking to a group of Spaniards yesterday <laughs> about this very problem. I said, it's an amazing thing. It, it, after, after battles and battles for 800 years, the, Sp right. they, the, the Muslims, the Mohammedans were here in Spain. And during the Reconquista, uh, they managed to expel them from Spain and have Catholicism as the, as the state religion. Now they're coming back invited in by the state. Yeah, figure it's that out. It's amazing. It's just the same thing all over Europe. It's, it's just, it's, it's amazing. To see this is amazing. And this, yeah. uh, this is, again, the left, this is the way the left behaves. So... In Mexico, it's a, way to, it's a way to attack society. It's a way to attack the church. It's a way to to uh, dilute everything that's serious: family, belief, yeah. social systems, everything. So in Mexico, I I'm under the impression that modern generations of Mexicans don't really know the Cristera. They don't really know the history. They've sort of lost that. Is that is that true? Is that fair to say? And and can probably, compare that probably and one of the. Yeah, one of the reasons is because it's not taught in the schools. Right. If you so then, if you read Mexican history as approved by the Mexican government for school children, there's no mention of it. No mention wow. of it. That's it's, it's crazy. A to civil me. war that took four years and killed yeah. thousands and thousands of people. No mention. Not even no honorable mention. mention. So in Spain, are they still taught about the Reconquista in Spain? Do, do they understand the history yes, of their own it's people? Taught, but, but, but it's a funny thing, Joseph, because there's shame attached to it. Oh wow! They're all, they're also they're also taught about exporting, if you will, exporting the Catholic faith to what is called today Latin America to the to the Americas, mm -hmm. and they're they're sort of taught that they should be ashamed of that. Oh man! Because That's so they've sad. destroyed all of these wonderful, marvelous. Uh, uh, primitive cultures that were that were just shining examples of culture and knowledge and science and and every and art. Uh, they've destroyed all of that and then killed all of the indigenous people by with plagues and and diseases that they brought. And so they're taught to be ashamed of that. It's ridiculous is not ridiculous. It's it's sinister. I to, agree. To teach that as an, as a shameful thing. It's unbelievable. But that, that's the way it's taught. That's so sad. You know, uh, one of my project, uh, I have like a bucket list of projects I want to do in life. One of them is a, um, a documentary, a feature length documentary film retelling the story of Hernan Cortez's uh, conquest of the Aztecs, but to do so from the original sources and not from the colonialist revisionist history that's taught today about all of that. And if they just read Bernal Diaz's you know, journal. You know, one of my dreams is. Hmm. One of my dreams is, and I'm pursuing it with every way that I possibly can. I want, I want a, a 10 minute audience with Gibson. Whew. 10, not 11 oh. minutes, 10 minutes. What, what would 10 you do with your 10 minutes? minutes? I, want to, I want to convince him to do a major, major move on the Battle of Lepanto. Oh, yes, you and me both. Oh, and, please. And only, he, and only Mel Gibson could do this justice. Only Gibson could do it justice. It is the most fascinating story in history. It's fantastic. And it's another thing that's never told or never yeah. taught. Yeah. Nobody knows. Few, few people outside of devout Catholics know the Battle of Lepanto. It changed yeah. the whole history of Europe. <laughs> right. Yes. 100%. Do you anyway, think Don Juan was who, murdered by his, dad, by, by his brother? Uh, do you Don think Juan? Don Juan was murdered by his brother, King Philip? Could have been. A little bit of insanity in that family, you know. I, I, I find it fascinating. There are some parallels between Hernan Cortez and Don Juan, maybe minor ones, but 
still, you know, Don Juan, he, he, he has his moment in time where he rises to the occasion. That's the Battle of Ponto. And does he ever rise? I mean, he rises. Yeah. It's amazing. Doesn't shrink from the task. Yeah. It's amazing. But then, two years old. Bro. Yeah. 22 but, years old. But that seems to be the height and the peak and the pinnacle. And then after that, it's all downhill. Like, you don't, you don't, you hardly hear anything from yeah. him after that. And then, of course, he's poisoned in, uh, in, in uh, Holland, at wherever it was. Uh, similar, Don Juan uh, to Don Juan is Hernan Cortez. Hernan Cortez has his moment. He rises to the occasion in the, in the conquest of the Aztecs. I mean, it is amazing what he does. And he does it for the right reasons, too. Yes. But after that, yes. it's all downhill from there. And you, you hardly hear anything from the guy after that. You know, so it's, I find them, these parallels, especially they're at the same time frame. They're really only separated by what, three decades? You know, four decades? But do you, uh, but do you, find, that, do you find that unique to these two people? I find that, I find that common throughout history mm -hmm. in great men and women. That they had their moment, they did what they were supposed to do, and then they fade away. Wow. That explains my career. Thanks, Bob. It's, it's, like, it's like they had their purpose. They had a purpose in life, and this was it. Yeah, this was it. Where, what was it, I? I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of this. I just remember with Pope Paul VI, he wrote Humanae Vitae. Did he ever write anything after that? No. Nope. <laughs> well, there, there we so, go. So Francis gets the Humani Vitae treatment with for Fiducia Suplicans, but he's not stopping. <laughs> he's there's still a pin in his uh, hand. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. No, you're not stopping that guy. You're not stopping him. Nope. What? Oh, no way. It kills me to no way. Hey, by the way, Janice and Mary Mary and uh, Shaquille, good morning to you. Susan, Miriam, Maria, and uh, Helen, good morning to you. Donna. Good morning to you. Aitna Murphy, Diego, good morning to you, my friend. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, appreciate seeing you here. Night of the Immaculata, good morning to you. Helen, again, good morning to you. I uh, really appreciate your commentary. Master Baker 78 is on from West Texas. Glad you're here. Thanks for doing it. Praise be to God. R. Leon was, uh, was hanging around at some point. I'm not sure. Is he still here? Good morning to you if you are. William Jones. Good morning to you, William Jones. Karen, once again, thank you for your generosity and thanks for being on the team today. Karen was apparently with you on Pilgrim in uh, Carmona. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Carmona. Karen, Karen is a is a great lady. She's a great lady. Amen to that. We had a group of, of pilgrims, about 20, 22 people came for uh, for a spiritual retreat, and then we're going to continue on touring the mostly religious sites in in, in southern Spain. Great. Great people. I think we had. I, I hope they had a good time. I had a great time, and I, I think we uh, we learned and we prayed. Some we we prayed and learned and said we had uh, mass together. It was very beautiful. Very beautiful time. Yeah. Amen. Oh, praise be to God. So, uh, Gregory, good morning to you. If you're hanging out with us and you've never commented before, can I just encourage you to drop us a comment? We'd love to have you on the team today. Let us know where you're from. Troy, good morning to you. Call in. If you've got questions for Father Murray, you want to throw them our way, do that in the com box. KSB, good morning to you. Amanda, good morning to you. Eric JMJ, Nick Vores, good morning to you. Glad you're here. Chicho, my friend. Chicho, brother, you sent me those terrible pictures of Jimmy Kimmel mocking the Lord Jesus. Can you imagine his judgment day? I mean, man, I, don't, I got enough problems. I don't want to be that guy. But, man, pray for, pray for his conversion. Uh, Anthony and Bridget Dunn, good morning to you. Chesty, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Semper Fi. Welcome to the team. Uh, I see Nick the Mike and on Rumbles. Robert DeBruce is here. Gus DMH is here. Sci-Fi Mike is here. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for being on the team today. Really oh. appreciate it. Smash that like button, Maria. I like the way you say that. It's, you got that accent to it, and it sounds so good when you do it. Mary Mary says, please pray, or please say a tiny prayer for me. My allergies have been horrible, and my lungs are are particularly bad. Well, we're going to pray. I've been going through that myself, so uh, it's been taking it out of me. So I, I'll, I'll be praying Thanks for you, too. Us. Jean, uh, Jean M. R., good morning from New Jersey. Glad you're on the team today. Thanks for doing it. Praise be to God. Ginger Gal is on the team today. Good morning to you. Teresa, good morning to, to you. Thanks for, for hanging out and being a part of the conversation today. Linda is here as well. Good morning and good morning, Father, she says. Linda, thanks for being a part of it. Uh, let, can we talk about, let's talk about Mass of the Ages. So I watched Mass of the Ages third installment last night. 
But, um, you know, I thought the first one was fantastic. And it's not just because you are in it, Father. I also thought it was had other redeeming qualities. But uh, but the fact oh, that you are sure. in it. <laughs> oh shucks! <laughs> oh shucks! Um, uh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna steal that from you from now on. For uh, steal it from uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes, I'm gonna steal. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> I'm gonna steal that from now. It's gonna be so good. Oh, uh, my family will be like, "Why is Dad quoting Veggie Tales? I don't understand." That's, that's yeah. gonna, <laughs> they won't Do get you know the that I was in my I was in my twenties. I was in my twenties when I when I finally started reading the the Old Testament and realized really? that these were actually people. In the yeah. old, I had no idea who they yeah. were. Not at all. Oh, that's awesome. Let's talk about the Mass of the Ages. You, you, I, I talked about it in the, one of the segments in the radio side of the show today, and oh, uh, after watching it last night, and I there was some big surprises in the film. But to your point, something you said a minute ago, which was the moms, boy, that was a tearjerker. Um, let me ask oh, you, fabulous. when you, sh when you shared your vocation that you just, you were called to the vocation of the priesthood, what was that like for your family? Mixed bag. It was a yeah. mixed bag. I, I had, I had a brother who was an atheist. Okay. Uh, uh, let me, let me qualify that a militant atheist. Oh, good times. Right. Fun conversations. <laughs> I remember, I remember asking my mom and dad, I said, why do you suppose he's an atheist? <laughs> and my mother and father both answered. They said, well, let me just put it this way. Had you been an atheist, your brother would by now at least be the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's great. laughs> Which taught me, which taught me a lot. <laughs> and I think, that, oh, that's hilarious. I think, that's that, so I think that, I think that the reason that there are atheists is for a lot of people to get attention who would normally not get attention. They get attention yeah. that way, hmm. and that's it. So anyway, he's well, come back to the faith. The, the, the atheist Baptist. brother, God bless him. Praise it was, be to it God. was, it was difficult for my family because I'll tell you something else that happened. I was away because I was the first of seven. I was away from my family when the implementation of Vatican II happened. Oh, so I came joy. back home on occasion for, for right to to brothers and sisters who had no idea what Catholic meant. Isn't that something? They, they just they had no, they they no because they went to Catholic schools, right? Wild. I mean, it's it's that simple. They just had no idea what I it must what I have was felt talking about or concerned about. It, it, I have to imagine, it, I was born in 74. It must have felt the world turn upside down from a Catholic perspective because, yeah, you know, did. Did. you don't have to love Vatican II or everything that came out of Vatican II to go, but Vatican II didn't give us what Bugnini gave us. Vatican II called for Gregorian no, chant and the all. Latin to be preserved. I have to, I have to keep reminding people, Joe, I have to keep reminding people on different shows that I'm not, I am not opposed to Vatican II. I've mm. read all of Vatican II. We studied it at the Gregorian University in theology, uh, studied it in depth. Uh, it, some of it is, is very beautiful. There are a couple things that should be, uh, uh, could, could use a little help, mm. right? Yeah. But it, it's not Vatican II, it's not Vatican II. It's what the people did with Vatican II after it. yeah how they took it they they stole it they stole it they they kidnapped it well to the victor go the wanted. spoils to the victor go the spoils yeah i was just in uh i was just at appomattox courthouse where lee surrendered to grant and there's a sign out front that says here is where the union was restored or something along those lines and i thought that's a pretty one-sided way of looking at the situation. I'm sure. I wonder how the neighbors thought about that. You know, when you put that sign up. Similarly, in Spain, well, maybe it the seems like the maybe the sign wasn't big enough to tell the whole truth. Maybe it wasn't. <laughs> was it a maybe it sign? wasn't. It was a big sign. It was a. Big, I'm going to be honest. It was a big sign. But maybe like similarly in Spain, maybe the progressives won, so they get to they get to they get to make the Catholic population feel guilty about their past. And was their past perfect? No, it wasn't. But it's not something to be completely ashamed about in the way they're doing today. 
So maybe the victor go the spoils. Uh, I think Bishop Robert Barron said that the uh, the liberals certainly won the war, or the battle at least, out of Vatican II, so they get to be the ones to interpret that. And here we are today, dealing with fiducia supercons and and everything else. Yeah, it's it's very too bad. Very too bad. Mm. Um what the, the thing that we have to realize as Catholics is that it will be remedied. <laughs> Probably not in our lifetime, but it will be mm. remedied. Yeah. So Christ, have, mass, Christ hasn't jumped out of the boat yet. Do you think Mass of the Ages, like one of the points I, I made about after having watched it is this film, and I was sort of teasing Jake, producer Jake about it, because I asked him if he'd watched it. He said no. I said, well, <laughs> turns out the movie's really not meant for traditionalists. This isn't really a film for trads. It's a film for your average Catholic so they can better understand why why trads believe the way they do or as passionate as they are about traditionalism. Would you say that's fair, Father? Uh, I, having not seen that the last, the last I, 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 my commentary on it is, is weak, right? Sure. I'll just say but this. It, overall. I'll just say this. Let me just say this. <clears throat> recently it's been brought to my attention people are are, are excited about these uh about the reparation or, or or three years of study or something about about the eucharist that they're proposing in the united states which came out of that study that that poll that that was conducted that 70 percent of american catholics don't believe in the real presence right i think that's i think that's an exaggerated uh figure i think it's more like 80 percent 85 oh, wow. percent don't believe right? I, wow. I, 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 I see it you don't treat something that you believe is god mm-hmm. the way that you just don't do that exactly you don't do that however here's the thing here's here's the thing they're talking about the the real presence as being a real a real theological problem all of the bishops are having meetings they love to have meetings by god do they love to have meetings <laughs> Let's have a meeting about a meeting about a meeting about a meeting, <laughs> right? This whole thing. And then, then then have another meeting to decide this and then divide into subcommittees. And yeah, you're going to need a council for this. That's you're going to need a panel. You want the solution? <laughs> I'll give you the solution. Let me, here, let me give you the solution. The new mass has produced at least 70%, has conducted, it brought people to the conclusion, percent of them at least, that the real presence of Christ is not in the Eucharist. The Tridentine Mass, do you know how many people in the Tridentine Mass doubt the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist? It's pretty low. Zero percent. Yeah. One, zero percent. One hundred percent of them believe in the real presence. Now, if you've got that as a solution, they're, they're, that's staring at you, and you've got a problem over here, what do you think the solution would be? <laughs> nope. More meetings. Let's let's exactly. have more meetings. <laughs> you know, and, Father. It's just amazing. It's so amazing. Like there. Okay, so there's this whole Eucharistic revival theme going on from USCCB, mm-hmm. and they're holding a huge conference in Indiana this year, this summer, and supposedly tens of thousands will show. And I have no doubt they probably will show in tens of thousands in droves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at at the and I, I when I first saw that, I'm like, okay, what is this going to accomplish? You're going to come together. You're going to have an emotional high experience. You're all going to feel really good about it. And then what? Is that number going to change? And w- when you you just quoted a stat, I, well, that stat came out, what, two years ago maybe? A tops? Like a year and a half or something like that? Yeah. yeah, it was like two years ago, uh, 67% of Catholics do not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. This last August, I was at a an industry, a Catholic media industry event, and a famous Jesuit commentator, I'll refrain from saying his name, but one that you might even respect and love, actually tried to make us believe that it. that's but <laughs> well, that's, that's a different rabbit oh, yeah. hole uh anyway um he he got up there and tried to suggest that that number has now been fixed and if they did some things and it's all better now it's cl- <laughs> it, I, I was like that's ridiculous i was just like what world do you live in? Oh like, gosh, don't make me laugh. Make are you living laugh. in one I'm of those states just... where marijuana is like totally legal now? <laughs> I mean, because 
Cause um I don't like how do you fix sixty seven percent in like six months like that's not a thing especially when you don't pursue to your point you don't pursue the things that are actually going to fix it communion on the tongue only w- why because that changes the heart and the mind about the reality of what we're dealing with here it's not so commonplace look, that look, it, to look, put here. put it look in some non consecrated hands look how, look how simple it is Martin Luther. And the reformers, in quotes, insisted on giving communion the hand to end the Catholic superstition of transubstantiation. It's very simple. Now, (laughs) we've followed suit and we've lost our same faith just as they did. I told you what the solution is. It's not another meeting. It's not another conference. It's not. It's not not a, not a, a, a... it's not a hootenanny with 10,000 people there. <laughs> and they'll probably end up giving communion out in paper cups or something. Oh, you know, in the, don't, the, don't say the, that, the, Father. This is, yeah, well, this, is what, this is what I'm saying. And then they, they can't figure it out. Of course they can figure out. They're not fools. They can. Not yes, fools. this is that's, I guess that's my frustration. I'm not opposed to They're conferences or, or getting together for big events. These are all great things. I've had some great ones in my life. But it just, I guess it's like you, you want to, you just want the pomp and the circumstance. You want the show, but you don't want to actually solve the problem. If you actually wanted to solve the problem, then you would be encouraging ad orientum. You'd be encouraging communion on the tongue and kneeling at the altar rail that needs to be reinstalled at all these parishes. And that was part of the third film that you've not seen. I'm going to spoil this. So put your fingers in your ear, Father, if you don't want to hear this. But the beginning of the film, there you go. The beginning of the film starts out by showing how many parishes, how many churches, how many beautiful old churches have been ransacked and converted into a bar, into a skate park, into a, a hotel, into a restaurant, into a jazzercise club or a racquetball tennis court or whatever. It's utterly disgusting to see something sacred and beautiful being used in such a profane way. And that is, I think that spoke volumes to me just in the first opening scenes. By the way, uh, Colored Pencil 101 says her sacred art is going to be displayed at this Eucharistic Congress this summer. I hope that that plants some seeds, Color. I'm glad you're going to do that. So thank you for based on for the sharing based that with on us. the prints I just saw on your website, Christine. Those are they're, those are lovely. Those depictions of the whole Eucharist. Oh, amazing! They're quite, they're quite beautiful. Maybe we could put a link to that in the show notes. That'd be awesome. Sure. David L. Good morning to you. The only Jesuit joke I know. What is the only thing that does not change in a Jesuit mass? The bread and the wine. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> woo. Don't tell Father McTay. Wow. Ouch. I was like, that's a big one right there. I'm coming, Elizabeth. Anyway, <clears throat> Sanford and Sons reference. <laughs> um, man. I'm coming, that was Elizabeth. Hot. My gosh, is that a flashback? <laughs> yeah. Woo. That's, a, that's, a, that's, 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 that's fire and brimstone, David. That's fire and brimstone. By the way, speaking of which, there is a surprise appearance from a Jesuit in the Mass of the Ages third installment, Father. Like, I didn't but see that coming. Of Saint Ignatius, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, mm-mm, mm-mm. but there was a famous Jesuit in the film. So, hey. Oh, uh, I guess... Father, Father, yes, Father Fezio. Father Fezio. Father that's Joseph right. Fezio. Yeah, a dear friend of mine. So don't don't speak ill of him. I will not. I will, I wasn't going to, but no, I didn't a, want to spoil it either because I don't know. He's a great guy. I, I don't know what I don't know what you've seen or not seen. Great priest. So are you going to? The, no, I, you know, the, I, I saw I saw the, the beginning of that film. Now that you mentioned it, uh, with where, where they've got a, a, a sort of an airhead uh, uh, giving a tour of of, of a, the hotel of a cast of a, of a chapel that was turned into, and they ask yeah. her what the a and M mean in the, in right. the stained glass window. And she's, she, you know, the air between one ear and the other. And she looked and yeah. said, we're not sure. We're not sure. Like this was a, this was a question that the, that the, that right. the redesigners yeah. had. We're not yeah, sure. Exactly. We, yeah. we think it's, we think it's the person who, who constructed the chapel secretly put in as in secretly. <laughs> yes. Hidden in a stained glass at the top of the, of the sanctuary. <laughs> Instead, of, the, instead of yeah. seeing Ave Maria, the obvious Ave Maria, no, it's it's uh, Arnold, Arnold uh, Muttenstein or something yeah. who <laughs> the designed Mutt- the chapel. <laughs> it was Meshach, that's what it was. Yeah. It, was it was Meshach. Abednego, Meshach. Abednego. Abednego and Meshach. Yeah. Shadrach got left out, that yes. poor fellow. 
Anyway, that um, that, like the, a Bendigo. A Bendigo. The, the worst part, though, was this same lady who's French had she didn't have the slightest clue about what any of it meant. And you're like, and, and that's where the real hammer drops in that scene. You're like, this is the eldest daughter of the church we're talking about, right? We're talking about how many incredible saints came, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Joan of Arc. I mean, how many incredible saints in Jean Vianney uh, came from France? And the this generation has no knowledge of it whatsoever. Again, yeah, it's like... That, that, that poor woman, if she's representative of, of, the, of that generation in France, she didn't have a clue. She did not yeah. have a clue. I, I think she probably battled to find out where the front door was. To it. Right. Just no idea <laughs> right. of anything. That was um, pretty sad. Pretty sad indeed. Madonna, good morning to you. Breweries and former Catholic churches in many cities. That's true. And that was one of the, uh, the, the it's just really a tragedy. And again, I, I, my point is, you don't have to be a rad trad. You don't have to be a traditionalist. You don't even have to like love or hate Vatican II to kind of come to some obvious common sense conclusions. And I think that's what the film does best. I think it does that very well, demonstrates and, and graphically communicates quickly these complex issues, what's at stake and why people love and think the way they do about the traditional form of piety and, and the sacraments. And I believe that its greatest effort will be that a non-traditional audience might watch this film. And similarly, your role in this entire endeavor, this this trilogy of, trilogy of films, your role was to sort of peel back this, what has been forgotten for most Catholics. And that is how the role Bugnini played, the role that uh, Freemasons played in, in what we are currently yeah. experiencing in the church. You are, you are the one who helped most people better understand those times. Um, so now in hindsight... I mean, are you going to go to the death? I've got to tell you something. I've got to tell you something. Uh, if that's true, I hope it is true. That would be one of the proudest accomplishments, thank God, in my life. I would be yeah. elated to die with, with that feather in my cap. Just to wake people up to what happened. Most people have no idea that, that what is being offered to them every Sunday is... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, down, it's, it's, it's Freemasonry. Yeah. Deluded, deluded theology, nothing. Yeah, I shouldn't say nothing. Well, but, but they got you know, together you, recently, you, Father. You don't, uh, they got together. They're in dialogue these days. I mean, Cardinal Coco Pomero is, seems pretty happy. I mean, pff, Martini would be I a happy almost, guy right now if he were I read, alive. I read that Cardinal Cardinal uh, what's it, Coco Puff what, yeah. is 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 in meetings with the, with the with the with the Freemasons. The Archbishop of Milan thinks that they're wonderful. We should. Have, he wants. He proposes having a, a new department for ongoing dialogue with the Freemasons. This is where are these people? What, if they were just on the enemy's side, they would be so helpful to the church. <laughs> yeah, I was going to spit my coffee out there for a second. Oh, don't. Do yeah, that. exactly. Why? Why? Why is that? Uh, I've asked you this before. I still boggles my mind, Father Murr. Earlier, you mentioned Paul VI. Paul VI writes Humani Vitae. The world beats him up over it, and he's like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> We're yeah, done. That's it. Um, Francis writes Fiducius yeah. Supicons, and the world beats him up for it. And he's like, oh, yeah? Hold my beer. Watch this. Wait till you see what comes next. I've just begun. We've only just begun. Right. Why does the... Why does one side of the coin have no problem wielding as much power, authority, and even some they don't even actually have... But who's going to stop them? They don't have any problem with that. But the other side of that equation, John, Sheen, the, John the 23rd, JP1, JP2, Benedict the 16th, they're like lumps on a well, log. When he talked about fire, he said, fire has two elements, light and heat. <laughs> we Catholics have the light of truth. The anti-Catholics have the heat, the passion, to spread their anti anti-Catholic message. They mm. they they have the passion, and if you look if you look at uh, evangelical Protestants, for example, very passionate. If you look at at young communists, passionate. If you look at at, uh, at at Freemasons, very passionate with their message. We are lacking that passion. We might have the light and sit smugly thinking that we have the light of truth, but we don't have the passion. Yeah. 
We don't. Uh, Mary uh, Antonia Mary Swift says, "Good morning, Father Murr from New Hampshire. How many how many how many feet of snow do you Good got morning. on the ground still in New Hampshire? I'm just curious. Uh, a parade of deaconesses. Ricky V is looking forward to the future to a parade. Now he's not really. I'm just teasing, but um, deaconesses. I mean." You had to. You got to go way back. You got to go way back in time, Father, to October of last year when Francis said, uh, "No ordination is meant for only men." And then fast forward, a lot has changed in just the last few months because apparently no, he's nothing, open. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. Nothing has changed. Mm-hmm. You knew very well when he said that 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 is that is something that's never going to change. You knew that he was saying it would change exactly. real soon. Exactly. And this is the same thing he does with everything. <clears throat> It is the same thing that all Marxists do. Mm. They change the language. They change the definition of of the language. The blessing for irregular couples isn't for couples. It's for individuals. And it's not really a blessing. Well, yes, it is. Well, let's call it that. Well, this and them. Now, we have have deaconesses, deaconettes, uh, but they're really not deacons. I mean, don't, don't let that fool that they're going to be called deacons doesn't really mean that they're deacons. You know, mm. it, it means this when we want it to, and it means that when we want it to. This is the ambiguity, which is absolutely a, a, a hallmark of, of modernism, and it's to be avoided at all costs. This is what they're, they're digging their own graves, because sooner or later, all of this has to be dug up again, reexamined, and it will be condemned. I'm telling mm. you, it will be. So don't I, I don't I just don't want good Catholics to lose patience with the whole thing. We've got to be super patient uh, while this while this uh, this facade is going on, and uh, that's it. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Just don't lose don't lose the faith. Keep it. Yeah, and keep on the street. You have narrow. to, in spite of it all, Daniel. Daniel, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Praise be to God. Mark also says that he, uh, this was apparently years ago, had dinner in a church brew, in a church brew works in, I guess this is Pittsburgh. Um, The sadness of it, that he realized during the dinner that it was a former church that he was having dinner in. And um, he never went back, obviously. But man, I've seen so many pictures and clips of, old churches across Europe being hijacked and used for these nefarious purposes. You know, uh, in this current scandal, I feel, especially like we have roots in Buffalo, they're going through it right now, but even in New Hampshire, um, if you have to sell a church, tear it down, deconsecrate it and tear yes. it down, sell the property, not the church. Joe, don't, don't leave that church Joe, in the hands of, of its enemies. I was alive in 1965 I was born in 1950, and I remember at the end of the council, our parish priests were so excited that the council had ended and it was now going to be implemented. And do you know what the biggest problem we were going to be facing in the church? Building new buildings to hold all of the people who were going to be coming. (laughs) Yeah, how that worked out. All of the converts. Oh, yes, absolutely. People were going to be coming. We, we did, where were we going to put these people? Mm-hmm. We had to build bigger bigger churches to accommodate them, bigger schools, et cetera, et cetera. It was about building. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't. All of a sudden, we're selling our, our churches uh, to breweries. Wonderful. That, that should tell you, that should show, you know, words are one thing, and you and I can talk all day long. These are facts. Look at them. They speak louder than you and I speak. Mm. Oh, it breaks my heart just to even think about it. Are you going to go to Dallas? I Look, you know, I'm an old man. <laughs> my traveling days, I, I, I wrote somebody and I said, I was invited, uh, very beautiful invitation by a number of people who would pay my way and everything else. Very lovely invitations. I, I said, I am untravelable. <laughs> I, 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 I had to go. I had to go back to the United States on a point of business a couple of years ago. It almost killed me. I'm wow. telling you, it almost killed me. Yeah, God, I'm getting old. I'm getting old, and uh, I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to stay right here in Andalusia and live and die in, in God's country. Yeah, praise be to God we'll for see. it too. We'll see. Yeah. All right. So, um, it, it, so you haven't seen it yet, but at the same time, I, I think your input is very critical, and I think it's very good. 
Uh, I think ultimately this is a very good series of films. So overall, on the whole, even without seeing the third film, do you think that this has been uh, a very fruitful endeavor with The Mass of the Ages? Do you think that this will bring about more fruit? Do you think more uh, normal, I say, suburban Catholics, ordinary Novus Ordo Catholics will see something like this and maybe they'll, it'll change their heart and their mind towards traditionalists? And do you see a day I would where hope, there's I would a reconquista so. of the hope. faith in the hearts of Catholics all over the world? Look, I, I can just go by this. <clears throat> My book, and I'm not even going to name the name. I'm not even going to mention the name of the book because I'm not here to plug a book. That's not the point. My book has sold incredibly well. I can't. I, I, it, it, it astonishes me. The letters that I get, emails that I get, are, are every day. I get ten to twenty emails from different oh, wow. from new people who've read the book and and are are excited about waking up to reality. He said, you know, having read your book, I see what's happening. I said, great, great. Because what I wrote is the absolute truth. And it's witnessed by Professor Roberto Di Mattei himself, who mm. knows that what I'm writing to be the truth. And he wrote a, re a beautiful intro to it. It's waking people up. People have been asleep for the longest time. And all of a sudden, they're waking up to reality. And I think yeah. that's great. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. And the the mass of, of the mass of the ages is growing. It's it's an, it's an amazing thing, Joe. When they prohibited it, it's been yeah. growing in numbers all over the world. Yeah, it's amazing. I just got a, I got a be beautiful letters from Africa, Africa, who are new to the faith, who are wow. absolutely returning to tradition. They had to learn the tradition because they never knew it. This is fantastic. Beautiful. That stuff. that's in the film. That part of that is in the film. And that was also, I have to say, very surprising. One of the things we think about when it comes to Africa is the culture that's been in, mixed into the liturgy. It's kind of we get it, we see that all the time in any examples that tend to come up. We see the culture and the liturgy combined. So you get a lot of liturgical dancing uh, as a result, and a lot of charismatic masses and liturgies, etc. Whereas the film depicted a growing traditional movement within the African uh, scene, specifically with Swahili in the film. And I thought that was incredible. That's beautiful. Because one of the things that I guess has attracted me to the traditional Latin mass, and I wasn't initially attracted to it, it's grown on me, was like even in my tiny little parish, and it's pretty tiny compared to the ones around it, we have the whole world. It's a microcosm. We got... We got Hispanics that don't speak English. We got Asians. We got Africans. We got Indians. We got, uh, you know, everybody in between all there. And guess what? We're all saying the same prayer uh, and the same tongue. It's kind of like the reverse to to uh, to Babylon, right? It's the reverse to Babel. It could work. It might work. It could actually. It might like, work, my gosh. I mean, if you go. <laughs> it only worked I, for 1950 years. Right. It could work again. We should try this thing. Look, Let's give look, this thing a there's spin. Probably, there's probably no one in the world who loves mariachi music more than myself. And musica ranchera. I love it. I'm a fanatic of it. I listen to it all the time. It's fantastic. I've had weddings in Mexico all the time, and these people are coming. We want a mariachi mass. You're, I said, you could either have your mariachi mass without this priest, or you could have this priest without the mariachi mass. You decide. Yeah. So what we did, yeah. what we did, I helped build a choir of 32 voices, and they sang in four parts. The mass in Latin it was fantastic, oh, wow. phenomenal. People would come from all over to listen to it. And right yeah. after the mass, the, the marriage mass, wedding mass right outside the door in the vestibule were the mariachi waiting and everybody came out of mass and to listen to mariachi music and congratulate it was fantastic but not inside but not and inside and i kept telling people i said yeah. there, there there are certain rules of of decorum and etiquette i said i would not go to the beach dressed this way at investments i wouldn't do that nor would i go dressed in a bathing suit to mass i wouldn't do that there are certain things for certain places, right? We respect this, we respect yeah. that. And this is probably one of the problems that we're having in what, what is left of Western civilization today. There are no rules. There, are, there, are nothing, there is no formality of anything. You can go to any, 
any restaurant dressed with uh, dressed in, in in khaki shorts or this on the restaurants that used to require a tie and jacket. And, no, 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 it's nothing, nothing anymore. This is a problem. This is a problem because we start behaving. We treat everybody the same, and that same has lowered and lowered and lowered and lowered to a to new lows. That same for everybody. Anyway, that's my yeah. homily for today. Edward Clancy is on the team today. Good morning to you, Edward. Thanks for doing it. Says, when at uh, World Youth Day in Madrid, I was at the Plaza del Sol when the atheists were protesting the church and the, uh, and Spain's participation. I saw pilgrims kneeling, praying the rosary while atheists spat and abused them. There are some pretty intense Im- video footage out of Spain of Spaniards defending Defending Holy Mother Church against these crazy, especially like the the, the feminists, the uh, militant feminists. Uh, boy, that was crazy video, but it was encouraging and inspiring to see the men stand up. Have you ever met a happier group of people? <laughs> no. Aren't they delightful and happy <laughs> and so, just smiles and hugs very and yeah, just and hearts so and so attractive, just, just you know, happy just, people. Yeah, like <laughs> oh, you, you warm the cockles of my heart to see in you. You know what I'm oh, saying? Good like God. yeah. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Abednego. <laughs> and Abednego. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, Edward, or uh, rather, Edwin. Good morning to you, Edwin. Glad you're on the team today. Thanks for doing it, James. Good morning morning to you praise be to god um i love seeing some of the commentary here and i think daniel over on on facebook was talking about a church that burned down you know that's the other thing too is the 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 rash of burning churches in north america and across europe yep. and and we still put our head in the sand father Murr, and oh, we still pretend Canada. yeah that's why that's why i said north america because i wanted to include both but um coming to california well, does California count? I'm not so sure. Anyway, uh, we put our head in the sand. It's like, kind of like America? Uh, well, I don't want it to be. I want to excommunicate it, but that's another story. Uh, I find the bishops are putting their head in their sand. They don't want to address the situation. Though we talked about the Eucharist a little bit ago. Similarly, when it comes to burning churches down across France, like nothing to see here, nothing to see here. I mean, hello, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going on here. And why don't we just admit it and then just deal with it in the best way we can? But they don't even want to do that. They want to pretend otherwise. It, things are only going to get worse, look Father, the if, if they're going to continue look to pretend. The desecration of, look at the desecration of our cathedrals. Right. We have people swearing, cursing, cussing. Uh, uh, unbelievable. And that we just take that. That's what we do. Why do we do we that? We roll over and play dead. Why do we do that? Uh, because we have leadership. We have leadership that's that's that is missing that passion. <laughs> they mm. they might have some of the light, but they don't have the passion. Is it because they're they afraid? The is it because they're afraid? It's a combination of two things. I think. I think they're afraid, and I also think that they don't care much. Wow. They don't have too much invested in that. It's not a not a big deal. I mean, look. One of the wow. things that Cardinal Cardinal Benelli said to Pope Paul when he suggested that that Gagnon do the the uh, investigation of the Roman Curia, he said he said, and what's more, Holy Father, you should have Gagnon because he believes in God. Mm. Never forget that. Uh, you just rocked me a little bit. It's one thing I would say. They're afraid. I can almost deal with that. Okay, great. They need courage. We just need to encourage them. We need to try to give them some courage. But they don't care. Like that's worse. I would much rather deal with a coward than deal with someone who's who's apathetic. I, I mean, that is well, that is mind boggling. Many, many people have written about this phenomenon. They said that the the opposite of of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. Wow. Wow. So, all right, we're about to run out of time here. Father Charles Murr has been on hanging out with us. So leave us with some good news. You said a minute ago, we just got to hold the faith. So do we do we resist? Do we recognize and resist? Do we just uh, ignore what comes out of the Vatican and just Look, go about it, our it's, business? It's, it's and- really quite simple. It's quite simple. We are to obey, in first place, God. Secondly, we have his holy word, sacred scripture. 
Thirdly, we have sacred tradition that comes to us as Catholics from the apostles. Jesus Christ taught the apostles we are apostolic. That is what is meant in the creed when we say we are one holy Catholic and apostolic. We have those three points to maintain. Uh, the, uh, the rest is opinion. Uh, a pope can have his opinion, I can have my opinion, and they can be different opinions. On time that that pope insists that this is Catholic doctrine, Catholic dogma, and it holds faith to the faithful, the, fight, the faithful are held to it, uh, then we just, we just uh, take it as his opinion and you can deal with it as you wish. I mm. choose not to deal with it. Yeah, no. amen. Kind of reminds me of those messages coming out of Texas, the hill country there with that uh, mission of divine mercy. They kind of made the same argument, didn't they? But that's where we're at. So live in a state of grace, pursue virtue, be obedient to your state and life. And, you know, if you get a chance to encourage Bishop, do so. But, man, Caleb the Mechanic, I'd much rather deal with a, uh, the, with a coward than, a, than an apathetic one. Because at least a coward, you have a fighting chance at getting him to get off that fence and move in the right direction. Apathy? Pfft, I'm not so sure. Father Murr, yeah. God bless you and God love you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob, God bless you. Bye-bye, We'll Joe. see you guys on Monday.